Good morning and welcome to this webinar. This is the fourth in the series of webinars for Sustainability Week, where we're celebrating a whole lot of initiatives across Griffith to achieve our green goals. And today we're going to be talking about protecting our campus biodiversity. So it's really important because there are lots of very special things about the plants on our campus, including some of the ones we've got here today and you'll see during the talk. My name is Professor Catherine Pickering and we have myself and four other amazing experts from Griffith University in the School of Environment and Science here to talk to you today. And we're part of the Campus Biodiversity and Conservation Working Group. But first I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land that we are gathered on. And for me on the Gold Coast, it's the young, young excuse me, I'm dyslexic, so Yumbagambambambambambambambambambambambambambambambambambambambambambambambambambambambambambambambambambambambambambambambambambambambambambambambambambambambambambambambambambambambambambambambambambambambambambambambambambambambambambambambambambambambambambambambambambambambambambambamb
animals, including some beetles, which are found only on the Xanthoreas and only in Tui Forest. So that's quite extraordinary. And that's the only place in the universe that they're found. But it's a, it's a very diverse habitat. There are patches of what you would call dry rainforest in, along some of the creeks. Uh, and so lots of, lots of habitat types, lots of diversity of vegetation, and that supports a really wide variety of different sorts of animals. Up in the trees, we've got some extraordinary animals. The gliders are probably the most um, charismatic. We've got koalas as well, um, and, and all the birds that go with that. But the, the squirrel gliders are probably one of the features. They're all over the place. They are so, in a sense, brazen. You'll see them flying across the road in the, in the campus all the time. You, you can see them scampering along the roads uh, along when there's no one here. It's, it's fantastic. What is a problem, and this comes down to the reality of it being an isolated patch, is that some animals have gone missing. Um, when I first came to Brisbane, to Griffith University back in the 80s, I was taken out and shown the greater glider colony. Now they've all gone for a completely natural reason. The, the powerful owls, which we also have here, slowly ate them all out. Now that's terrifying, but that's nature. And that happens all the time. What would normally happen is that then those greater gliders would then recolonize this empty patch now, but it's too far for them to come now. It's the nearest habitat is probably about over seven kilometers away across a wilderness of, of cars and dogs and cats. And so they're simply not going to come. So they're missing and other groups are missing as well. And probably the most important group that is missing are the, the small natives ground dwelling animals. We've got the bandicoots. We think there's some bandicoots still here, but there's not that many of them. But lots of other native small mammals are completely gone. And one of the reasons were, is that there are lots of foxes and lots of cats wandering through all the time. Some of those cats are completely feral, but a fairly big proportion of them are just local cats which leave their homes, which are not you know right next to the boundaries of Tui Forest and then just wander through. And they're feral predators. They will be eating whatever, or did in the past, eat whatever native mammals they could find. So that's a problem, and that's part of the, the, the issue that we have of, of having an isolated pop area. But when it comes to the birds, we have got a spectacular biodiversity of birds here. And Tui Forest is actually a really superb place for birds to stop by, forest-dwelling birds, will fly through and stop by on their migrations. We've had a, quite a range of what you would normally regard as deep rainforest birds turning up in the middle of Tui Forest on their way somewhere between Lamington and somewhere else, wherever there's rainforest. But there they are. They decided it looked a little bit like rainforest and stayed. So these are just some of the reasons why this is such a special place for us. We're so glad to have it. Some of, thanks so much for that, Daryl. And that is fabulous in highlighting the values of the Tui Forest and the Nathan campus, but also some of these really important threats. And they're important for our campuses, but they're also important for all remnant forests. And now I'm going to hand over to Guy Casterly, who's sitting next to me, who's going to be talking about the remnant forests on the Gold Coast campus, because we're really lucky to have these important patches in the city, both on the Gold Coast and at Nathan. Thanks very much, Catherine. Um, so the Gold Coast campus, much like the Nathan campus of uh, Griffith University, is situated in an urban environment. And we know that around the world, um, urbanisation is one of the key threats that is actually that biodiversity is having to face these days. Um, more than 50% of the global population is living in urban areas. And in Australia, that figure is as high as 85%. So most of us here in Australia are living in a city or urban conglomeration where we're having an impact on our natural environment. Part of that urbanisation process is where we find that as people move to cities, we have to have space for them to go and live in. So we start um, you know, clearing vegetation, we start building in residential suburbs, we start building shopping malls and providing roads and infrastructure for all the people that are moving to these cities. But as a result of that, some of our natural habitats are lost in the process. And um, what we find on the Gold Coast in particular is that we do have these pockets of natural vegetation that have remained, and they're slightly more connected than what the Nathan Campus Tui Forest might be in the sense that there are other 
patches of vegetation that the Gold Coast campus is connected with. So we have them connected to drainage channels, for example, that cannot be cleared, for example, because it provides an important watershed or it's too boggy for um, developers to put a road through or something. So we have these natural remnants in the urban landscape that provide habitat for certain species. So the Gold Coast campus is fairly unique in that sense in that it actually is somewhat connected through the urban landscape um, with other types of habitat, but is also important in its own right in that the vegetation that remains on the campus is quite significant in, in that it's a, an important vegetation community. So the, the forest on the Gold Coast um, is quite a bit smaller than the forest that we have at the Nathan campus. We're only sitting with about 28 hectares of, of remnant forest, and but that remnant forest is a threatened ecological community. It's a, um, a, a sterophyll or a eucalypt, a eucalypt forest, um, a blackbutt eucalypt. And um, that community um, ecologically is an important community in Southeast Queensland. A lot of it has been lost through urbanization. So um, the remnant forest that we have on the Gold Coast campus is one of the few last remaining patches of this particular habitat type that we have in Southeast Queensland. So it's really important for what's going on here. Um, so from a vegetation community perspective, it's really important to maintain this, this area. But it's also important for wildlife. Daryl's already mentioned a range of species that we can find in these urban patches, for example. And it's the same on the Gold Coast. Um, we, we have um, done surveys and monitoring efforts to find out just what species occur in our patch of bushland here on the Gold Coast. And it's quite diverse. We have you know, upwards of um, 66 species of birds. We have 14 species of mammal that we've recorded in the forest and 18 species of herpeta fauna. So that's frogs and reptiles, for example. Excuse me, frogs and reptiles all combined. Um, and it's not just the communities as a whole that's important, but we also have these remnant patches in the urban landscape that protect threatened species. Um, some of these species that we find, for example, on the Gold Coast, include um, really prominent things like koala. Um, so we have um, a small number of koala on the Gold Coast uh, in the, the habitat remnants in, on campus. It's not by any means um, potentially a viable population in any way, but we have those communities that, and populations that live in these urban remnants. We also have other um, threatened species, such as the glossy black cockatoo um, and the powerful owl. So these species have been found um, in our surveys. So we would have um, student surveys that go out and do assessments on campus. So we, we integrate a lot of what we have on the Gold Coast campus as a living experiment, essentially. So we're able to take our students out and actually take them into the bush and give them that practical hands-on experience where they can see what's actually happening in these urban landscapes and how we protect biodiversity in these urbanized landscapes and what species actually still persist in these areas. So the glossy black cockatoo um, was quite regularly seen on campus and it's, it's a kind of a species that's quite happy to, to go about its business while um, there's people milling around, for example. So when the glossy black cockatoo is sitting feeding in a she-oak tree, for example, it'll be busy eating the cones and extracting all the kernels from it. And it's quite happy to have students and staff and everybody milling around underneath it, looking at it, you know, um, in, in amazement, essentially. Um, and as these birds use the, those specific resources, they're quite specialized in terms of their feeding activity. They only use that particular she-oak resource. Um, they move across the landscape and, and as the urbanization impact happens in the landscape, we find more and more of these patches disappearing and these specialized species like the glossy black cockatoo need to move further afield to try and find the resources that they need. And the Gold Coast campus had the birds seen for a number of years. Um, there was some more development and some of the birds disappeared, but we've been seeing them recently. And, um, and that may be a response to all the fires that have happened over the summer, for example, where the birds have now started moving back into some of these really important urban refuges that provide resources for the species. Other species like the um, powerful owl, for example, um, are seen pretty infrequently. So we're pretty lucky. We've had student surveys go out and see these two species um, on campus. Um, but we need more monitoring to go and have a look and see just how well these species are doing and, and how um, whether they resident or whether they're just moving through these patches as Daryl um, suggested as well. So all of this um, information or all these um, the species that live in these particular landscapes, what it highlights for us is that the Griffith University campus and the habitats that are secured on the campus um, 
are providing important refuges for these wildlife species. Um, we're able to secure communities that function within the landscape. So many of the birds may provide a dispersal mechanism for other um, trees, for example. Uh, some of the frogs may only persist in some of those areas, but we need to learn more about it. So what we need to do is actually do more long-term monitoring to find out just how persistent those communities are living in these urban patches and um, just how many patches they need, how connected are, are our patches in the urban landscape. So we can try and find out a bit more about what is going on and actually then manage those uh, places appropriately because specifically on the Gold Coast, and I'm sure it happens at Tui Forest as well, because we're sitting in the urban landscape, Daryl mentioned the threats posed by um, foxes, dogs and cats, for example, but we also have, we're sitting in an urban matrix where we have humans as another potential um, player in the game where people actually use these spaces as recreational um, act, um, or activity zones. So you'll have people walking through the forest, some places may have trail bikes or mountain bikes, um, and all of those can have an impact on the biodiversity as well. So going forward, it's great to make sure that we retain these habitats, but we need to learn more about them. Um, and Catherine will tell us a bit more about the actual fantastic flora that we have um, in these landscapes as well. So thanks. So as Daryl's mentioned with the forests at Nathan, there's enormous diversity in the animals. And there's also, as he's highlighted, enormous importance in the plants. And this includes, as he mentioned, the xanthoria. And Guy's now talked about the black bark forest, which is on the south side of Smith Street. I've had a role for about the last 10 years as being a landscape <coughs> advisor on the Gold Coast campus. And that's to focus on some of the areas of gardens. And we've got some of the plants here. And part of that is a general issue of, again, Guy's talking about this need to promote biodiversity. And one of the ways we can do that individually is by promoting biodiversity in our gardens to provide more resources to conserve the plants, but also to provide resources that support wildlife in our gardens, native bees, lizards, um, butterflies, birds, etc. And so we've planted up the Gold Coast campus with well over 100 native species from southeast Queensland. There's only about three non-native species on the whole of the Gold Coast in all those gardens. And we're using that to test out and showcase what you can do in your gardens, what people can do all over the southeast Queensland. And that's because southeast Queensland has over 3,600 different species of plants and over 400 of those are in cultivation. And so we test them out and then we use them and work with others to promote. <clears throat> so hiding behind Guy is a sign saying Grow Native. And this is an initiative that we did with an environmental consulting company, Natura Pacific, with funding from the Queensland government. And that's a free app you can download and to find out more about what species might be suitable for your garden. And in that, we actually have all these options like Hamptons, rainforest, minimalist, architectural, butterfly, bee, any type of biodiversity. Um, so Guy's really aware of this because he and one of his students were involved in selecting the species. So that's a way, not only at Griffith, but in our area, we can support all that biodiversity that he and Daryl have talked about. So we're really proud of that and we just want you to realise that we've got incredibly beautiful plants on the campus and that they are native and that they support um, biodiversity and that you can grow those as well. The other thing is, of course, we've been talking about Nathan and the Gold Coast, but there is important biodiversity. Obviously, Mount Gravatt is part of that Tui Forest connected um, area. There are some special features around the um, South Bank, but Logan is also another really important campus. And it was basically pasture land, but now we've managed to turn that into a really beautiful area where we've got the campus itself, which is the landscaping again is using natives. And it's more of a, an, a US American style campus like aesthetic and the way that the gardens are set out. We've also got the incredible arboretum that the Logan City Council have planted there. And that's got over 70 species of high biodiverse and cultural value from Logan. And we've also just with that, We've also dealing, there are two lakes there that were actually created by Alistair, one of the, the key landscape people at the uni, to actually provide, uh, deal with waste, uh, water sensitive urban design and provide habitat for biodiversity. So when you see those lakes, they've actually been built and he and others have actually, even on the Gold Coast, recreated areas of forest. 
So we just want you to realize that when you look around, there's a lot of work and ideas and concepts gone in to try and make the place really beautiful, but most importantly, conserving local ecosystems, biodiversity and their functions. And so in a moment, what we're going to hear is about one of those really important functions. And so we're going to be, because Griffith has um, uh, forest ecosystems and they are really important in terms of providing a whole range of services. And remember right at the very beginning in the webinar on Monday, Brendan Mackey was here talking to us about the importance of reducing carbon emissions um, and the strategies that Griffiths are doing. And one of those is about our biodiversity. So Brendan, can you tell us about what those for all the other things those forests are doing for us? They're also helping us with our carbon sequestering. Yes, that's right. <coughs> Catherine, so as I, as I, well, first of all, I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners on mm -hmm. whose land we meet and pay respect to their elders, past, present and emerging. And I always like to add that I support the Uluru Statement from the heart and urge the Australian government to implement all its recommendations. Uh, so, yeah, Griffith's forest ecosystems are also very important carbon sinks and stocks. And just let me explain what I mean by that. So if people were listening in on Monday, they would have heard us talk about Griffith's um, net zero emission commitment. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have committed to reducing Griffith's greenhouse gas emissions to net zero by 2050 in line with the recommendations of the IPCC in the Governmental Panel on Climate Change. So where do these emissions arise from? So about two thirds of the additional greenhouse gases in the atmosphere are from humans burning fossil fuel, coal, oil and gas. Gas is a fossil mm -hmm. fuel. Um, two thirds. The other third actually comes from deforestation and degradation. So we've got two problems when it comes to mitigating greenhouse gas emissions. We have to rapidly transit from using fossil fuel as a source of energy to clean energy sources like wind and solar, tidal maybe, um, and others. Uh, and we have to uh, stop emissions from deforestation and degradation. So, uh, and this is where forest ecosystems come mm -hmm. in. So how does the carbon get into forests? Well, it's a, it's a natural process, isn't it? <laughs> That's what yeah, you see here. Uh, so when you look at a, any plant, actually, mm -hmm. this one here or a tree, if you take out the water, half the volume, half the mass, mm -hmm. I should say, of what you're looking at is carbon. So plants absorb carbon dioxide and they use that carbon in photosynthesis to produce mm -hmm. sugars and that's the carbohydrates, mm -hmm. that's the building blocks for biomass. So when we look at a forest ecosystem, half is what you, of what you're seeing is carbon. In terms of the living biomass, the vast majority is stored in the woody stems and branches and roots of big old trees. So the older a tree gets, the more carbon mm -hmm. it amasses. So what's really important is how much carbon is kept out of the atmosphere for how long. Mm -hmm. So it's the accumulated, accumulating aggregate stock mm -hmm. of carbon that's important. Mm -hmm. But not only is there carbon in the living tree, there's also carbon in the dead mm -hmm. biomass. So when the tree mm -hmm. dies and falls over, that carbon hangs around there for a long mm -hmm. time. And then a proportion of that goes into the soil, gets incorporated in the soil. In fact, all plants and trees in particular, in fact, any woody mm -hmm. perennial plant is constantly mm -hmm. pumping organic exudates mm -hmm. into the soil and overturning mm -hmm. fine root hairs. Mm -hmm. So uh, between all of those processes, there's massive uh, organic carbon stored in the soil. And globally, there's as much carbon. So if we look at a, mm -hmm. the total forest ecosystem carbon stock globally, there's as much stored mm -hmm. below ground as mm -hmm. above ground. So that's why we talk about the forest ecosystem carbon stock, not just mm -hmm. the carbon that's in the tree. Mm -hmm. So uh, as part of our net zero emission commitment, in addition to reducing our greenhouse gas emissions from, from fossil mm -hmm. fuel, we're also going to do a better job of managing our forests. Mm -hmm. By, by um, no, we need to go back to a previous slide and stay on that one for a little bit, thank you. Um, so, so what we've done is a first, what we call a first pass assessment based on available data 
of how much carbon is stored in our forest. We've heard there's about 124 hectares of forest, mm. there's about 100, 120 hectares of tui mm. and about four hectares or so here and there's some trees and plantings out of Mm. We've, got the, Logan Arboretum. The We've local, got the Logan Arboretum. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, Arboretum. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, using available data, we've, um, this, this slide shows our first pass assessment. Mm. So, our total forest ecosystem carbon stock is about 82,000 mm. equivalent tonnes of CO2. So, what do I mean by that? Well, when you have a, 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 a unit of carbon mm. as biomass, um, if you combust it mm. or it dies and decomposes, it, it gets degassed mm. into the atmosphere. Mm. It's an oxidisation mm. process, so it becomes a gas. Mm. It's degassed mm. into the atmosphere as carbon dioxide. Mm. And to go from carbon to CO2, you just multiply it by the atomic weight. Mm. So you multiply it to, to, to translate, mm. if you like, mm. CO2, you multiply mm. a unit of CO2 mm. by 3.67, Mm. and you get the equivalent mm. CO2. Mm. So the total amount of carbon that's stored in our in our in Griffith's forests mm. is equivalent to, if it were to be oxidised yeah. yeah. to 82,000 tonnes of CO2. Oh. Now that's equivalent to the annual emissions of about 5,125 5, Australians. Right? And of course, forest plant ecosystems mm. are dynamic. Mm. So plants are continually mm. absorbing mm. CO2 from the atmosphere. Mm. They're also um, respiring, yeah. right? So about about half, a little bit, well it varies a bit, mm. often it's a little bit mm. less than half of, of, of the carbon that a tree absorbs mm. is used in respiration. Mm. And then the rest is petitioned mm. into these different plant parts. Um, but if you think about it, uh, uh, the bigger a tree is, each year it grows a little bit more, mm. it gets a little bit fatter, mm. and, and this goes on for a long mm. time, mm. hundreds of years. Mm. We, our, our trees, you know, uh, Australian eucalypt trees are long lived. Yeah. Right. Very long lived, um, and they're very dense. They mm. grow very densely as well. Mm. So they grow slow, but they grow big and mm. and they're old and they accumulate mm. over time. So uh, you know, uh, again, as a first pass estimate. Um, if you look at the annual increment mm. in the growth mm. of the biomass stock, mm. uh, it, it, our, our, our Griffith forest biomass carbon stock will increase by about 1,314 tonnes of CO2 equivalent per year, which is equivalent to the annual CO2 emissions of 82 Australians. Right? Mm. So, you know, these are, these are measurable and significant mm. numbers. Even though it's a small mm. forest, it's still making that kind of cont contribution. And that really highlights just how much carbon is in even small patches of forest and how critical it is to keep as much forest as possible. Yeah, that's that's right. Uh, and of course, so, you know, uh, that carbon, of course, mm. is, is is the kind of basic mm. infrastructure of the habitat mm. for all the wildlife. So mm. I mean, it's got all these mm. other values, mm. but here's an additional value that we haven't been thinking mm. about. So as part of thinking about how we so um, again, just going mm. back to the university sustainability mm. plan, mm. the sustainability plan, you know, uh, has has elevated the significance mm. of our forests for its biodiversity and other mm. values that we'll hear about mm. later from Sam, mm. but also because of the mitigate what we call the mitigation mm. value of the forest. Mm. So in addition to thinking about how we manage the forest for biodiversity mm. conservation, mm. we also have to think about how we manage it to um, optimize its mitigation value. So. The next slide, please. So what does this mean? What are the implications of ecosystem carbon for forest mm. stewardship? Well, what do we have to do to keep that working? We want to avoid, as part of our net zero emissions mm. commitment, we have to avoid mm. um, um, uh, emissions from deforestation yeah. degradation of yeah. our forests. Right? Well, the first thing it means, there can't be any more deforestation for roads, car parks and buildings. Mm. Right? I mean, we can't yeah. continue to expand into the forest as we have in the yeah. past. Uh, if we want, if we want a new building, we need to demolish the existing building, mm -hmm. and rather than having a bigger footprint, we need to go mm -hmm. higher. Or we need to be thinking about, as our vice chancellor mm -hmm. aimed, to develop mm -hmm. a new campus mm -hmm. in the city mm -hmm. where the forest or the ecosystems mm -hmm. were lost mm -hmm. um, a couple of hundred years mm -hmm. ago, right? So that's the first implication. Mm -hmm. There's a big implication right mm -hmm. up front, mm -hmm. kind of long-term mm -hmm. campus infrastructure asset mm -hmm. plan. 
There's also implications for forest management. Mm. Now, this is a controversial area. Mm. Uh, you know, people, you know, it's in the news a lot, mm. post our post the Black Summer mm. fires. Mm. Um, but the science is really clear on this. Mm. You know, under extreme fire weather conditions that we're getting more and more of with climate change, yeah. broad scale fuel reduction burning um, makes very, very little yeah. difference in terms of asset protection. What makes a difference to asset protection as in a built asset like a mm. like a building mm. uh, is strategic fuel reduction within 40 metres of mm. the building. So in terms of controlling the massive litter, doing it over a whole forest, um, there's no evidence mm. that does any good. Mm. But within 40 metres, fuel reduction does. So uh, I would argue that you know there's there's a, that's something we need to be giving a lot more thinking to. It also means we can't be logging any trees or doing what forests call mm. thinning because that's actually, as I said, most of mm. the carbon is in the woody yeah. biomass of, of trees, the big old trees. Big old trees. And if you're taking out mm. trees, you're taking out young trees. Well, if you're taking out, yeah. um, the, you're, you're taking out mm. most of the biomass. Right? Mm. Uh, and if you're thinning, you're preventing the younger trees from accumulating biomass. Mm. The other important thing to note about these forests is they were all logged in the past, mm. so they actually don't have the granddad and mum yeah. trees, like the biggest yeah. trees, yeah. aren't there. Yeah. So there's hundreds of years of forest growth left in these things before they reach kind of maximum tree mm. size. There's huge sequestration potential. Yeah. Um, and the last, again, and this is another uh, uh, air, uh, aspect where it completely dovetails with what we need to do for biodiversity mm. is retain dead wood. Mm. Right? All uh, that habitat. For the, especially, of course, woody debris. Yeah. I mean, we know that's critical habitat for all sorts mm. of wildlife, mm. invertebrates, and mm. other, 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 other fauna, mm. um, and 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 other plants, mm. and fungi, and things. Mm. But it's also a critical um, component of the carbon stock as well. Yeah. It's not just living biomass that has carbon, dead biomass has carbon mm. as well. And then finally, if this is going to be part of our um, net zero emissions, we need to be monitoring and evaluating um, uh, these eco, what we call the forest ecosystem dynamics yeah. in terms of the carbon, mm. in terms of the carbon budget. So as I said, we, we did what I would call a level one mm. um, assessment based on available data, we need to go right down to level three, where we put in place a network of long-term monitoring plots. And, and you know, ideally, we would incorporate mm. this into our teaching and learning mm. courses, where as part of field work, people will go out and take all the, yeah. means, all the different measurements you need to make, not just about the trees, but also about mm. the litter and mm. also about the soil. Mm. So actually, you need, you need to mm. sample all three. But, you know, so you need to have a representative set of plots mm. of the right dimensions and put in place a protocol and uh, and take these annual measurements and uh, actually integrate these into some process modelling so you can kind of project, you know, where 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 things are going. Uh, and then finally, we, that will give us the numbers that will enable us to incorporate these measurements of, of our forest ecosystem, carbon stocks and flows into our university's greenhouse gas accounting. So we can do that. And thank you so much for that, Brendan. And it really highlights the whole range of the ecosystem services. But I also think one of the things that it highlights is this incredible rich depth of knowledge and expertise at Griffith when we've got people like Brendan working from a global scale all the way down to the Arboretum at Logan, the Black Buck Forest on the Gold Coast or Tui Forest. And we just want you to wander around the campuses and recognise how much more the values, the whole range of them that we have and with that, it's now time to talk to Associate Professor Sam Capon from Nathan to talk to you about what the working group is doing and how we want to capture your perceptions and views and values about our forests and our plants and animals on our campuses. And now you know a lot more about this critical component of what they're doing for us already via carbon sequestering. So Sam. Thanks, Catherine, and thanks to everyone that's spoken this morning. Um, as you can see, we have an awful lot to value and celebrate in our biodiversity on all of our campuses. Um, but we also face a challenge with um, increasing pressures from climate change, urbanisation, the development of our campuses, um, other pressures we've heard about, such as um, feral foxes and cats. Um, and so 
you know, we have this responsibility to meet that challenge and protect our ecological values. We also have a great opportunity, um, both at the university, to utilise our biodiversity more in our teaching and learning and our research, um, and also to engage with um, the community, other partners um, in in, the, in our stewardship and um, managing and promoting uh, conservation as well. So it's a great privilege to be part of um, the newly established uh, Biodiversity and Conservation Working Group under the Sustainability Subcommittee. Uh, that working group comprises uh, around 12 academics and professional staff on the university from all of our campuses. Um, we have expertise in a really wide range of disciplines from social science to uh, landscaping. Um, and we've been tasked with developing a plan for um, conservation of biodiversity over the next six months or so. Um, we have some research assistants supporting us and a lot of really exciting activities um, that hopefully you can get involved in as well. So we set ourselves in the working group for um, major goals. So first of all, we're really um, starting with documenting our ecological values. There's been a lot of work done on, on both campuses in terms of compiling information, um, historical information about the species that are present. So um, people like Daryl and Guy that have done a lot of work um, over many years in our forests um, and on the campuses. So we've been compiling that information, compiling information as Brendan's just talked about with regards to um, the functions of um, our ecosystems and biodiversity as well. Um, and we're going to make that available um, to the university community and more broadly um, during this process. We're also really interested in understanding how those values have changed over time and what's been driving those changes, both with regards to the threats and pressures that our biodiversity faces, but also in terms of how um, our management actions and our policy are driving those changes. And of course, we always have to consider um, the risk of changes going into the future and the different potential scenarios for our biodiversity under climate change and those other pressures as well. Uh, we have some really interesting projects actually ongoing at the moment. So um, Dr. Paul Oliver in the School of Environmental Science, for instance, is uh, supervising students working on understanding how our reptile species in Tui Forest have changed over time. So comparing historical records um, with what's there now. And we really want to do more of this. Um, so compiling both anecdotal information as Daryl referred to the greater gliders but um other information that's out there so we can start understanding maybe what we've lost and in some cases uh say koalas in tui forest what we may have gained um so we're really interested in hearing from as many people as possible um with regards to your knowledge as well about how things have changed and what there is to value so one of the key activities we're starting off within um the early phases of developing our plan is uh, a survey to gauge people's values and the way you use our biodiversity and ecosystems on the campuses. We've set up a, um, an email address for people to register their interest or be able to provide stories or information for us. Um, and we'd really love to hear from you. So the email address for that is biodiversity at griffiths.edu.au and that will be appearing, um, I think, both in the chat and on one of our final slides. So as well as understanding what we've got and how it's changing and what's driving those changes, um, we obviously want to use that to inform what are the actions that we need to take so that we can maintain resilience, so we can conserve our biodiversity um, and in some cases enhance our ecosystems so that they can be robust in the face of all the pressures, so that our islands in suburbia um, and, and our landscape gardens as well can really do the most to protect our biodiversity going to the future and all the different ways that we value it. Um, so, so we'll be working with a wide range of stakeholders to look at um, the current existing actions that are being taken. I, I see in the chat there's already been reference to um, Brisbane City Council's feral management programs, for instance, and then really using that to identify where the gaps are and what the priorities for future management are, um, both within the university and working with our different partners to see how we can work together to best protect our biodiversity. And finally, we want to really capitalise on this opportunity of doing all this work um, to really promote conservation of our biodiversity, um, build awareness um, in all areas of our university community and beyond and engagement so we can all appreciate what we've got and work together to conserve it. So um, we'll look to um, developing uh, more forms for engagement. So. Um, as well as registering to be part of that, that mailing list. We'll look to have uh, more events and support existing events um, and communicating everything that we, we do as a working group over the course of our plan. And we really, really look forward to hearing from you um, to make that as uh, equitable and robust as possible.
Thanks very much for that, Sam. And as you can see, there's a lot of expertise here and we're just some of the members of that working group. There are a lot more people out there contributing to this project. And we just want to, you know, as the faces here today, acknowledge that expertise and that depth of knowledge and not only in the academic areas, but across particularly facilities management, where there are some amazing people maintaining, monitoring, supporting the biodiversity on the campuses and helping work. You know, they're the people who are the nuts and bolts about making, controlling um, the, dealing with the risks, dealing with pests, diseases, etc. design, maintenance, the fire management and all of those. So, you know, we're very, very lucky at Griffith, but now's our chance to actually hear from you. And we hope first up where we've got some feedback about the number of people who have been seeing koala. And I see that amazingly. We've got at least 44 people oh, wow. have seen koala sometime on one of our campuses. That's and great. I know that That's great. I think all three of us have seen them. And I know that um, at Nathan, Sam and Daryl have seen them there. And in fact, I think there was just outside the building that they're in um, at the Bray Centre, there was one at one point looking a little lonely, just near security. I wonder whether it thought that might be a good safe place to be. Um, in terms of possums, there are 33. And the interesting thing about that is there's a lot more possums but of course they're uh, out more at night. Yeah. Uh, and so that's one of the things that's really important to know about Australian biodiversity, that it's very often active at night. It's out, you know, it's nocturnal, and that means that it's more when you're around on campus. And it's really interesting talking to the security team on campus. They know a lot about a lot of the animals that are around, and they're actually in some ways some of our best monitors for what's going on, because they're out at night. In terms of things, the brush turkeys, with I can't, you know, a key part of Griffith is seeing a brush turkey wandering around and they have really important ecosystem service functions and that is you'll see them turning over the litter and that's really important to maintain some of these processes that's Brendan's right. been talking about with the carbon and the litter etc. Nutrient cycle. Yeah and they're really they're doing a fabulous job for us although every so often I know the gardeners get a bit frustrated when they've just spread them yeah. all over the paths and stuff like that but that's part of living with biodiversity. So we're really happy with that. So one of the things is that we've got the questions up and somebody's asked, what will the Griffith community be proud of with respect to our campus biodiversity? And hopefully you've seen some of the answers today and we'll be continuing to do this work about surveying people, surveying the biodiversity, surveying the ecosystem services, the benefits that it's providing for us, a whole range of them. Um, and these values, and that's going to include things like the spiritual, recreational, health, et cetera, value, because there's a lot of research about how nature helps us in all of those aspects. And we know that within the lockdown, um, people have been valuing the urban biodiversity even more, the number of people participating and posting about um, what they're seeing. So that's really important. Um, is there anybody removing the... Well, why don't we see goannas anymore on the Nathan campus? Ah, okay. With that, I'll hand over to... That's a good to, question. To, 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 to Daryl. Yeah, that's a great question. When I first came here in the, um, in the, in the 80s, uh, there was goannas everywhere. And we had lots of, co lots of common, common rooms. And they, were, they would even come into the common rooms and, you know, look for scones and that scare, that scare everybody to death. Um, they were around up until the really serious drought that we had in about 20, 25, um, 2005, 6, 7, that sort of time. Since then, they've pretty much disappeared. There is a few still around. Um, we don't, I don't know why the, the drought knocked them off, but it, it seems to be related to that. But they're, they're coming back. They are definitely coming back, which is a great thing. So that's fantastic that in some cases, it, one of the things that's really interesting about it is that sometimes there's species become less common and we're really concerned about the issues and the effect of it. And sometimes there can be more shorter term perturbations or changes. And it's really important for us to understand what's driving those changes, what's happening. And, yeah, I mean that, and that, you know, that question also, also harks back to what Daryl said earlier about, you know, it's a natural process that a mm. given population Know, will, mm. will decline and maybe become mm. locally extirpated mm. and then be replenished. Mm. Um, so, and the Australian environment is naturally, uh, you know, the year-to-year -year variability in rainfall is enormous mm. and the biota has evolved to mm. be adapted to that. So it's, it's this um, boom and bust, mm. you know, 
um, kind of kind of population dynamic that's very characteristic of Australia. So naturally, it's not unusual for a local population to be expectated. But as Daryl was saying, this is where the connectivity conservation yeah. comes in. Yeah, and that's one of those really important ones around and, that. And I'll just add with the with the bushfires we had you know, last yeah. summer. Um, uh, you know, it's those remnant patches or lightly bird habitat patches that are going to repopulate the rest of the forest, right? Mm. So it's, you know, the, the, that's the good thing is the Australian wildlife is adapted to this kind of boom and bust environment. Yeah, and, and you know, we've noticed with that, and Daryl has mentioned about how there were some animals coming in, some birds. Yes, that's uh, right. That in effect, some of the green areas of the city has acted as refuges that's right, yeah. um, to then go back out. But again, we've got to manage and that, that. And that actually covers on one of the other questions there about why the biodiversity on campus matters. Is it because it's part of a larger system? It's not just a single isolated pocket that we're looking mm. at. It's part of that holistic mm environment that we're mm. trying to conserve within the urban landscape more broadly and having these refuges here is an important process to make sure that they act as sources for species to recolonize other areas that have been impacted but also just as refuges to maintain resident mm. populations and mm. the wetlands that we're creating yeah at, 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 at um, um, Logan, Logan and, will, will perform that function too for like like water birds. Yeah, and that's one of those really important things is having that habitat. Um, with the question, uh, and sorry, I jumped ahead around that, and thanks for picking that up. I'll have to go on. It's, it's about the feral cats. And the university does have a feral animal management strategy on each campus. And that, of course, has to be consistent with um, hu uh, humane uh, processes of dealing with them, whether they're foxes, rats. Um, we don't often get questions about the rats, but we have to also deal with them and mice, et cetera, yeah. uh, and balance out those. And so we do have the programs around that. And um, within the facilities management, they deal with those and have those uh, um, actions. And it's been one of the things with, again, people not being on the campuses so much. Some uh, native animals, but some feral animals were actually a bit more obvious as they were moving around because of that. Um, we've got Patty has asked us there about what are the different campuses look like in terms of biodiversity in 2025 and um, this is going to be a really interesting one so I might start off with uh, Nathan with Daryl and Sam if you want to start off with what do you think TUI will look like we hope. Well that's a really tough one but um, what I really hope is that we can retain what we've got and add to what we've got. So we've we've lost things. Um, I think it was Brendan who mentioned that yeah, this this the, all these patches have have lost a lot of trees. The really big old eucalypts have, have gone. They were cleared out or burnt during fires a long long time ago. What would be fantastic if we went re bring back things that should be here, but also very importantly keep what we've got. So yeah, that's that what I, that's what I would say. Uh, and I guess I'd add to that, I'd like to see in so that's five years time, um, just to really strengthen the engagement with the forest between our university community and the surrounding community. Mm -hmm. And we've seen that during this year, um, many, many more people coming into the forest to use it and, and celebrate it. So I think I'd really like to see that continue to happen in a, in a wise way. Thanks so much, Sam and Daryl. With our... Uh, for me, uh, on this campus, I have, of course, and I think the three of us would be very keen to see the endangered blackbutt forest looking even healthier, yeah. better, um, more sustainable with some big old trees and, and dealing with the issues around that. Yeah, so one issue we haven't discussed is weeds. Mm. Yeah. So, and that's uh, a big issue. Uh, well, in terms of what the forest will look like, it would be nice yeah. if in five years' time... There were less few, weeds. There were weeds, yeah. And with that, it happens weeds, to segue yeah. into something else that I love about yeah. the campuses, which is one of the big problems with weeds is that a lot of them are garden escapees. Yeah. And that's one of the difficulties with these forest remnants that, you know, you might have a lovely species in your garden, but they can easily jump the back fence and become weeds in the local area. And we've actually had students survey the forest on the Gold Coast campus to look at this problem yeah. with the weedy verges near it. And one of the things you can do to help with that is by actually planting native. So grow native and use it. One of the reasons yeah. that the Queensland government gave us the funding for that was because they knew that if we can promote people growing native species, particularly from the local area, and on the app, you can actually put in your postcode and it will tell you what were the native species to your postcode pre-clearing. And so you can actually be that specific to say, I'm going to grow these plants 
that were in the local area. And we're really conscious of this around the campus. And that's one of the reasons we've had such a big campaign that on the landscaped areas, as well as the natural forest, we're promoting it. And we do things like give away native seed from some of the understory species to promote people using them in their gardens that look good in the gardens, but also therefore are going to be less likely to be weeds. And I think I think one of the other ways that we can look at you know, well, having our biodiversity vision for 2025 is to try and improve the functional value of the actual landscape. Yeah. So if if we have fragmented or resulted in a corridor or put a road in or a new building, try and reconnect some of those little patches and pockets using a, a rope bridge or something mm. for a possum or a gliders, for example. Mm. So we can try and see more of these things to actually facilitate some of those functional mm. processes. I think it would be really fantastic if we, in five years' time that's really achievable. Yeah, and we've had enormous expertise around that. Um, so we've had questions here about how will Griffith protect the biodiversity in the face of climate change and other growing pressures. And with that, there's, it's true of a more general situation, but what it's about is that it's about reducing other threats. So That's things right. like weeds, feral animals, et cetera. So a, a way of increasing the resilience of the ecosystem to deal with climate change. It's also obviously, and this is what Brendan, it's about us also not contributing to climate change. Yeah, yeah that's right. Yeah, yeah. And it's got to come back to, we've got to stop creating the problem and then trying to fix it by the campus. Yeah, that's that's right. I mean, the most important thing we can do is achieve net zero greenhouse yeah. gas emissions because yeah. that will limit global warming. People have heard about, you know, limiting global warming below two degrees mm. above pre-industrial levels or between mm. one and five. The reason is once you get above these thresholds, the risk just escalates. Yeah. And and uh, like extreme temperature events, right? Yeah. And and uh, and winter drought. So the big problem we had last summer was this really long drought and a really hot spring. Yeah. So extreme fire weather conditions. Mm. Uh, you know, uh, 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 so you know, taking that's the most important thing we can do. And then the second most important thing we can do, as you just said, is take off these other anthropogenic pressures, mm. which includes. Uh, all the things we've been yeah. talking about, the, the impact of feral animals and weeds and inappropriate, mm. you know, um, um, fire fire management of one, forest mm. management of mm. one kind or another. And when we do that, what we allow uh, uh, is the natural adaptive capacity of, of, of these systems mm. to kick in. Now, you know, we, we, we forget that these forests have been managed for, uh, mm. uh, you know, how long have we had forests? 100 million years plus, right? It's called natural selection. I mean, it's actually called evolution. Right? So it's natural selection operating on the the genetic and phenotypic diversity within a population, and, and all those interactions that that selects, you know, the traits that are the best adapted to the prevailing and changing conditions. So that's the process we have to really you know, enable. And just at a personal level, with that, um, you know. We can all do our bit in all sorts of ways, not only at Griffith, but externally. And one of them is that, Brendan, I know you came to uni today in an electric vehicle. I did indeed. And, um, you know, I scooted in on my electric scooter. And I think one of the things, again, in the talk earlier was about the ways we get to campus. And so there are these additional ways that we can be doing stuff broader than just at sure. uni um, at an individual level. So. Um, so that next person, Anonymous, was, are wildlife bridges a viable solution for the patchy landscapes and how does an area have to be for it to be worth it? And Daryl, it's over to Bridge Man. Uh, <laughs> um, yes, they, they certainly have serve, a, serve a really important purpose. So bridges can be as simple as a rope simply going across a road. And, and I think Guy just mentioned that the gliders and possums and other things will use them. And so that's really simple. For the bigger animals, you do need a bigger structure. Um, the bigger structures are really expensive and difficult to build. So you're not going to have lots of them. You can, but they, they are there and, and they're growing in, in numbers all the time. It's fantastic to see. Um, but you do have to have a really strong argument from to allow animals to get across from one big patch to the other patch on the other side. What we really don't want is continuously dividing and and fragmenting and isolating populations from from each other. So what what is much more viable are uh, under the road. So we have got in Queensland we've got um, various pipes and big culverts going under the road everywhere. You don't see them because you drive on the top of them. 
but they're everywhere. And there's some very simple and very effective little ways to put in ledgers. And a huge array of animals are now using those. So, you know, this is a completely new, it's a kind of a hybrid field of, of applied ecology that's coming out now and really making some big, big changes. So that's, that's for the future. That will increase those sorts of bridges and connections across roads. And Daryl, I've also um, heard you talk about before and something that's close to my heart in our area of research is riparian restoration. Yes. The Shui Forest as well, the potential to link our island in suburbia with other islands. Absolutely. And if we had the chance, we could talk about the way that this an island in suburbia, Ritui Forest, is now slowly becoming connected up along some of the creek lines. So they, they, they go out into the suburbs, but there's often lots of riparian vegetation going along them. And, the, and lots of animals can use them. The problem is there's some big gaps in them. But there are simple ways that we can hopefully fill in these gaps and allow the connections to, to occur, which yeah. is something we really hope will happen in a bigger way. I think that you know a lot of that riparian restoration work too is being um, done by our wonderful catchment groups and yeah. um, community groups that we can really engage with too to um, yep. to work together. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, we're running towards the end of time, so we're just going to do two more questions. And it's fantastic that people have uh, put up a lot of questions and a lot of responses. And don't forget. And we'll put the slide up at the end again, reminding you about that biodiversity at griffith.edu.au email address to contact us and there will be the survey. But Daryl, I'm going to put it back to you because we've got two questions about birds. One of them is, would the university ever intervene in the protection of these species uh, for the kookaburras and others birds that eat at the uni bar are obviously very hungry since none has been there, for, so no one's been there for months. Could we have a feeding program or would that be considered inappropriate? And then uh, we've had another question asking, is there any way to discourage people from feeding all that wildlife? Now, I happen to know, Daryl, you happen to have talked and produced some information about this. That is true. Um, th those questions are perfect. They exemplify the problem that we've got at the moment. Um, it's been regarded as a terrible thing to feed animals in, in Australia for forever. Um, and that's not necessarily the case if you, you can do it properly. But if we went straight to the problem, you know, which everybody will be aware of, there are places where you can go where you can't enjoy your fish and chips because you're going to get in, in, you know, completely taken over by hungry looking animals. Let me tell you something straight now. Those animals are not hungry. They don't need the food. Nearly all the times the food that they're snatching from us, scavenging from us, is inappropriate for them. They don't need it. They don't. They should be just feeding naturally. So I am very strongly opposed to publicly feeding animals. And although those kookaburras appear to be hungry, they they not they're not hungry. They um they can find their own natural food and will do so as long as we provide them with the space to do so. Thanks very much for that, Daryl. And he's being very, very um, reticent there. But in fact, there's an excellent book that all of us have got that Daryl's produced about feeding wildlife. So just so you know about that. Now we're running out of, of time and we had some questions about plants, but uh, they've already been answered, including some of the spectacular plants we've got here on the table in front of us. And these are planted to promote growth of colors, but they also are really important in biodiversity uh, because red flowers are ones that are feeding birds. So we're really lucky in Australia, we've got high bird biodiversity and we've got lots of these really spectacular tough birds. But we need to write, uh, write, uh, come to a, an end today. Thank you for the people with the questions, etc. Don't forget, there is that biodiversity at griffith.edu.au website, uh, email, and we're going to be doing a survey and we're going to be increasing the amount of information publicly available about the biodiversity on the campuses. So we'd just like to thank all of the people who've spoken today. We're incredibly lucky with this depth and richness of experience. And also behind the scenes, the incredible tech team who's making this all seamlessly run for us academics. Very appreciative of them as well. And particularly thank you for participating today and listening in and finding out more about the biodiversity at this, but also the earlier webinars that have happened this and for the VC for her strong advocacy around this and through Brendan and Peter and then down to the working group. The way that Griffith is really getting serious 
about green credentials and, and revigorating and really dealing with these. And both what we hope the webinars have shown you is the behind the, the scenes and the front of scenes actions that we're taking. So thank you very much.